Were you aware that at the inauguration of every United States president, that in Washington, D.C., an occult ritual is held to raise the spirit of Osiris from the underworld so that it can take its rightful place in every United States president? They call him the great architect of the universe, but they identify him as the god Osiris, as he was known to the Egyptians, and Apollo, as he was known to the Greeks. When you look at the Great Seal, what you see in the images are Egyptian symbols, but in the mottos, it's prophecies about Apollo. It's on every U.S. dollar, and uh, it's a troubling uh, thought, isn't it, to imagine that we carry on our person more often than we have the Word of God on our person. We carry on our person a prophecy about the coming of the Antichrist. My guest, Tom Horn, says something began in the year 2012 that will reach its apex in 2016, and he's going to talk about that, but tell me something I was not aware of, that the key founding fathers of our nation were not Christian, but were Masons. That's absolutely right, uh, Sid. In fact, as many as 44 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons, uh, and they were the Freemasons really of the European order, meaning that they were committed to building a, an occult form of a democracy that was based on what's called the Atlantean scheme. This was coming out of Europe. What Francis Bacon believed, he was the head of a secret society in Europe, very popular and very powerful, and they had wealthy people behind them, and they believed that there had been an original Atlantis and Atlantis had been great because Atlantis had taken its orders from the gods of ancient history. And when they turned their backs on the gods, Atlantis crumbled. And so Francis Bacon's idea was we will build a new occult democracy based on this Atlantean scheme in which we're basically going to take our marching orders from the spirits of these invisible deities. Okay, how's this tie in with Masons? Well, Freemasons in the United States early on were receiving funding. Uh, there was persons, there were, there were people from Europe coming over here. They actually saw in the new continent the opportunity to develop a new world order that uh, would be under essentially the influence of these ancient spirits that political realities in Europe was not going to allow them to establish over there. So this was basically fresh pickings. Oh, okay, but, but uh, what you're saying, though, is there's something evil about Masons. I've got relatives that are Masons. What, what are you saying? Uh, actually, I was a pastor for 25 years. I had Freemasons in my church on my board. So, but these were 32nd degree Freemasons who, uh, they were part of a fraternity. And they didn't get into any of that other hocus pocus and occultism and whatever that was going on early on. However, uh, said, when you get past the 32nd degree, when you go to 33rd degree Freemasonry, it becomes something entirely different. Okay, what if someone was a 33rd degree Mason, what would they know that the others don't? Well, for instance, I had a state senator tell me, ask me basically, he said, were you aware that at the inauguration of every United States president, that in Washington, D.C., an occult ritual is held to raise the spirit of Osiris from the underworld so that it can take its rightful place in every United States president? That absolutely blew me away. Yeah, I thought, th th this is within Masons? That's within Masons. As a matter of fact, I went there to verify it myself. I took my wife, Nita, with me, but I wanted to know if that was a fact, because if that's true, that's an astonishing idea that an occult ritual such as that would be held. Uh, only just a little way on 16th Street in Washington, D.C. Well, well, who, who is the, the God? House. Who's the God of Masons? Well, the God of the Freemasons, according to their own experts, Albert Pike, Mackey, the others, uh, they call him the great architect of the universe, but they identify him as the God Osiris, 
as he was known to the Egyptians, and Apollo as he was known to the Greeks. In fact, what that's, when you look at the great seal, what you see in the images are Egyptian symbols, but in the mottos, it's prophecies about Apollo. Look at the... Look uh, at, and again, these false deities are another name for the Antichrist. Now, on the U.S. $1 bill, we have the great seal. Right. Tell me what's on there. Well, what's on the great seal, especially the obverse side, the, the reverse side of the great seal, it's on every U.S. dollar. And uh, it's a troubling uh, thought, isn't it, to imagine that we carry on our person more often than we have the Word of God on our person, we carry on our person a prophecy about the coming of the Antichrist. Now, you have the symbol that is Egyptian, you have the mottos that are in Latin. Uh, the uh, Anuet Coeptus is a, is a Latin uh, motto referring to the return of the god Jupiter, who will in the future take his rightful re-enthronement over the cosmos, and his son, Apollo, uh, is in the Novus Ordo Seclorum. That is a prophecy from the Cume Sibyl, the most powerful of all of the uh, Apollinian priestesses gave the prophecy from which Novus Ordo Seclorum is taken, in which she predicted that at the end of time, Apollo will return to reign upon the earth once again at the dawn of a new golden age. Oh, or the Antichrist. Who put that on well, the scene? And, and, who, put, and, who put it? There? And the reason I say the Antichrist is because in more than one place in the New Testament, it actually identifies the spirit by name that will fill the Antichrist. Uh, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.3, he will be the son of perdition. This is the Greek word apalia, Apollo, Apollyon. Uh, in Revelation 17.8, the beast shall rise up out of the bottomless pit and enter into perdition, Apollia, Apollyon, Apollo. In fact, in Greek literature, the god Apollo was known as both Apollyon and Apollo. Who put that on the U.S. dollar? Who put it on our seal? Well, it happened over a period of time. There was a man by the name of Tom Thompson who was commissioned by the Freemasons to design the Great Seal. No, no, but who, who, who authorized it? Who put it on there? Oh, well, I, who put it on the $1 bill? Yeah. This was Franklin Roosevelt. And, uh, Franklin Roosevelt? Right. Does science have the technology today to take the DNA of these false deities that are being prayed for within Masons uh, to, uh, to come to earth for a utopia who will be the Antichrist. Do they have, can they take the DNA from these false gods and put it in someone today and resurrect the Antichrist? We have the technology to mix species, perhaps mix uh, a human with an animal. Transhumanism. Explain this. Well, that's absolutely right. In fact, we're doing it in laboratories around the world. When most people today hear about the stem cell sciences, they yes. don't realize that a great deal of that is talking about the creation of a part human, part animal embryo that then can be used for experimental purposes. Uh, now, transhumanism itself is the idea that we're going to use that kind of science and other kinds of science to create a new form of mankind. But why do we want to create a new form of mankind? Well, of course, you know, if you talk to the transhumanists, they're utopians. They believe we can live forever. We can have immortal life without the bother of having to ask Jesus to give it to us. We can upload our brains. We can live uh, forever inside artificial intelligence systems. There's a great deal that the transhumanist community believes. But when it comes to genetics, when it comes to kind of repeating what happened in the days of Noah, where these fallen and angels corrupted bloodlines, uh, they believe that we can improve our species, open new modes of perception by blending ourselves with animals. We might even be able to see into the supernatural realm. Okay, and among wait, the transhumanists, they aspire to do that. Who is DARPA and what are they doing? DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's one of the large departments of the U.S. that uses our tax dollars to hire other people to come up with great ideas, private laboratories, things like that. But in last year's operating budget and in this year's operating budget, for instance, they have set aside millions of dollars for rewriting the DNA of our soldiers. Why would they want to rewrite the DNA of our soldiers? Super soldier technology. And furthermore, they are being advised by some of the top 
think tanks in the world that our competitors, our enemies, are privately developing this tele technology right now, and that if we don't get ahead of it, in fact, the Jasons, which is one of the top scientific advisory panels in the world, told them that by the end of 2012, if we weren't secretly, privately, ahead of the human enhancement revolution, we would fall irreparably behind and be dominated on the future battlefield. What about the mark of the beast? How does this tie it? Well, the mark of the beast, I think this could play in in the form of like a living chip, a bio chip. We are doing experiments right now with uh, chips that can deliver medicines into your systems, but some of these could be designed uh, to actually carry payloads, to carry vectors as they're called, to work almost like a virus that could introduce uh, a new genetic code to rewrite your genetic makeup. And some people believe that perhaps that's how the mark of the beast will alter humans so that they're no longer redeemable by literally going through their system and rewriting their genetic makeup. I, you're, you're saying a lot. But who's funding this? Well, you are. I, I am. No, not me. As a matter of fact, well, because there are departments in the U.S. government, like the National Institute of Health, uh, that's the largest one in the U.S. that doles out your money for health-related science and research. And right now, they are giving grants to universities that are actually uh, developing the legalese, the language that will be used for extending, for instance, constitutional rights to human non-humans, to humans of the future whose genetic material has been altered sufficiently enough to no longer even be considered to be human. Well, what about the ethics of this? Will these people be considered humans? Will they be considered equal to us? Will they be able to vote? Or, or will they be like pets if they're half human and half animal? <laughs> Uh, well, I tell you, it, it really gets into some madness, but like the Brookings Institute right now is asking that question for you, and they're saying that, for instance, within 10 years, Brookings Institute, number one policy think tank in the world that bends the ear of our lawmakers, has a new series called The Future of the Constitution, in which they're saying within 10 years, we will be creating genetically engineered homosexual communities, and that because their genetics are sufficiently different than ours, Hours, we have to create the legalese that will extend to them Bill of Rights and constitutional privileges. You know what he's saying? He's saying our tax dollars are funding this research that's going on right now. Well, wait till you find out that the, the Masonic plan is within the Washington Monument, the Capitol, uh, the Vatican, and there's symbols and signs that allow spiritually this evil to flood in. Of course, they disguise it as good. Where'd that come from? Well, again, it goes back to the influences of these early Freemasons who had an idea about how they wanted to build what we would call an occult democracy. For instance, you can go to the Library of Congress website and read an article called The Most Approved Plan. And this goes back to early America where they were advertising for different architectural firms to submit their plan about how the capital city could be built. And after all the plans came in, our own government website says they were all rejected because Thomas Jefferson wanted a plan that would be based similar to the design in Rome where you would have a dome facing an obelisk. And furthermore, he wanted it dedicated to all pagan gods. That's on our own government website. So that, that's exactly this what This represents uh, the sexual organs, the, the, say the Washington Monument, and, and you say the, uh, the Capitol represents that. What does that mean in, in Masonic and uh, occultic terms? Well, because the Freemasons, a great deal of their mysticism is based on ancient Egyptian magic. And this design, a dome, which is the ever-pregnant belly of Isis in their mythology, facing an obelisk, which is the erect manhood of the god Osiris, was a magic utility. This was designed in ancient Egypt for one purpose, and that was to raise uh, from the underworld the spirit of 
Osiris so he could take his place in the Pharaoh so that the country, Egypt, could have divine representation in their king. Well, that's exactly the template you have laid out in Washington, D.C. It's exactly the template you have at the Vatican. Why well, well, is that the, the, the same things in the Vatican? Same thing at the Vatican where you have a dome facing an obelisk. As a matter of fact, the obelisk in St. Peter's Square was removed from the ancient city of Heliopolis where it was built and dedicated to the god Osiris. And when they took it to the Vatican and when Pope Sixtus had it put in the middle of the square there, he actually performed an exorcism on it trying to expel the demon of Osiris from the obelisk. And, and again, this Osiris is the same, it's a code for Antichrist of the New Covenant. Well, it is the god Apollo to the Greeks. In fact, you see that marriage not only on the Great Seal. Look at the uh, Statue of Liberty, who was built by Eiffel, the famous Eiffel Tower builder that was built by French Freemasons. That has, that's a cult too? Well, it is, it, according to its own literature, you can look it up and read it yourself. It was built to have the body of Isis, which was dedicated to Osiris, and the head of Apollo. So once again, it is the marriage of the uh, Egyptian Osiris and the Greek god. God, Apollo, which is one and the same according to many ancient historians. Now, you say there's a ma Masonic significance even to 9-11. Well, we believe there is, uh, and without getting bogged down, uh, uh, President George W. Bush, January 20, 2001, he steps up, he gives his inaugural, and twice he refers to the angel that rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. Where'd that term come from? That is a Freemason, well, it, first of all, it's an occultic term, it refers to Metatron, there's various names for the angel in the whirlwind, but for years, in fact, for at least a decade before, not 911, occultists said that when it came time to initiate the new world order, the code word would be the angel in the whirlwind. And if you go in where I have been, into the house of the temple, the headquarters of the 33rd degree Freemasons, they have a dedicatory in there to George W. Bush for donating more than a million dollars to help propagate Freemasonry in the United States. Yeah, and I voted for him, so I'm not picking and, on him. Well, you know, this is a very pervasive thing. This, this isn't just some random speculation. Uh, now, why do you say the years 212 to 216, something very significant involving the Antichrist will occur? Why do you say that? Well, first of all, um, I got on that because the, uh, uh, there is a 500-year-old Mayan prophecy that said that in the colonial count 1776, there would be a 13-step countdown ending in the year 2012. And when you read the prophecy, it is literally five, 300 years earlier describing the great seal of the United States. We have 1776, 13 steps over which is hovering the all-seeing eye, which is a prophecy of the return of that God starting in 2012 through 2016, but also many other ancient cultures, ancient Jews, the Hindu in their Kali Yuga calendar, even, uh, Sid, even turn of the century Protestant reformers like old sinners in the hands of an angry God, Jonathan Edwards, right. wrote in his letters, which are preserved in university, that he believed the Antichrist would appear between the years 2012 and 2016. We found that redundancy over and over, and the question became, what was was motivating these people? By what inspiration were people for both hundreds of years and thousands of years persuaded that the end would begin in the year 2012 through the year 2016? Why did they believe that? What do you believe? Well, I believe when I look around the world today, two things are going to happen. One, uh, we definitely could see the emergence of the man of sin any time now. And that also leads me to believe that we could have one of the greatest revivals in the history of humanity at any moment. I'm looking forward to that. That was one of the most amazing things, briefly, that you found. Well, one of the most amazing things had to be that a Chilambalam
Uh -huh. A Mayan prophet. Okay. <laughs> 300 years ahead of time. But you know what was cool about it? Because this guy converted to Christianity as a result of the... Uh, but I thought the Mayans missed it in their Oh, Oh, the, the Spanish came in and they brought with him the gospel. And this was university level work that was done uh, when interpreting these ancient prophecies at the university level. They found that this guy had given his life to the Lord. So now it put a brand new twist on how and why, why would he be talking about the colonial count 1776 and basically describing the great seal of the United States. Uh, it put a whole different kind of fascination on the whole thing. Despise not prophesying, right? Did this young convert, though at one time he was one of the worst of pagans, did he indeed receive a revelation from God? He may have. But, but I thought the Mayans predicted and, we, and they missed the date. No, they never said that. In fact, I'm on uh, many TV shows and, and conferences that you can watch on YouTube for the last 10 years saying they never said that. What they said is actually more interesting. They said the end of 2012 would end an era and then a new and final dispensation of man would begin. Now, that's more interesting. Here's the question I pose to you, and I, I, I pose to you, if... You have to have some special DNA put into you so you'll live much longer, so you won't get cancer and dread diseases, and that's the mark of the beast. Uh, will you accept it?